I was walking around the Russian area with Brandon and Dad. We were walking along the pedestrian bridge. The footbridge followed an automotive bridge shortly, then at the center dipped below the level of the cars so one could easily see the support beams that held the concrete mass up. Zip-tied to several of the supports were what I thought were Arduino Megas. Several times I touted my knowledge and told my dad and brother, that one's an Arduino Mega. They did their signature poker face and nod. Every few support beams, there was one of these Arduinos. The installation job of these Arduinos was especially crappy. The thing wasn't weather sealed at all, save for a large piece of styrofoam covering the component side. Glue held the styrofoam, as it covered all the header pinholes and sensitive parts. The styrofoam was sandwiched between the Arduino and the pillar, and large white zip ties held the monstrosity against the bridge. I had no idea what the devices were for, and my dad intended on coming in as the Russian Roads Department Communications Service Provider, and he intended on making the installation right. I later went up and inspected the unit, only to find that this blue PCB had thrown me off. The device was not an Arduino, and in fact it predated the Arduino. It was huge, by the way, probably double the size of an ITX motherboard. All that was similar between it and an Arduino was the blue PCB. The Arduino probably superseded this device, as on other parts of the path there were actual Arduino Megas. I think I broke some of the weathered styrofoam off during my inspection. We kept walking back and forth looking at the microcontrollers. Then suddenly, an alarm went off, and thousands of people appeared, and were all trying to get out of whatever park we were in. Yes, we were in a fenced-in park of some sort, or a museum of some sort. Some national emergency had broken out, and the Russians were escorting everyone out of the park as quickly as possible. The guards were scrambling around, as if they were looking for someone. I was nervous that somehow the emergency was my fault. As we went down a large set of stairs and approached the exit, I could see another park across a canal and a huge fence. It was like North Korea's Epcot, just like USA's Epcot, with rides and attractions highlighting all sorts of wonders from our universe, only with scary, cartoony safety regulations. Their main attractions were somewhere in the background. It was a massive spectacle, but it was in a dense fog, and I never found out what it was. The most amazing North Korean attraction I saw was right at the fence line. There were several tracks, what looked like a rail yard following the fence as far as the eye could see. There was a long consist of rail cars, and in the center, an abnormally large boxcar with no roof. Every few minutes from this boxcar, a short, plump, cartoony rocket would shoot out. This was no SpaceX. The rocket launched at a 45 degree angle, emitted almost no smoke, and it wobbled wildly at first. It was clear that there were people inside, many children, and they were having so much fun. They were bouncing off the walls inside, making that thing jump up and down, and almost stretch because of their sheer excitement. This cannot be safe, I thought. Indeed, there was little stopping the line of rockets still on the ground from bouncing around, and they did. Just like a kid on a trampoline, the next rocket queued to launch bounced up joyfully out of the boxcar, its hole completely elastic looking, as if it were made of a balloon. A moment of weightlessness passed before the rocket disappeared back into the boxcar. I was still on the other side of the canals and fences in Russia, so all I could see was the North Korean park. I had my vlogging camera, so I was secretly taking video. I knew I would get in trouble if the Russians saw what I was doing. I was up on a hill. Walking up the hill, I could easily cross a fence, which the hill's incline defeated. There was a flat spot on ground level above that of the fence top. I stayed up there shortly, but then decided to get down for fear that this was a Russian sniping position. If the Russians, in their routine checks of this top, saw me, they would think I was an enemy sniper. There was, after all, an emergency situation below. All of a sudden, in the rail yard across the canal, a string of rail cars came barreling down another track. There was a collision with some sort of iron pillar, and cars went flying as they derailed. Another rocket launched, unaffected. Despite the derailment, it seemed like the kids were still having fun over there, in the jiggly rockets. Without incident, I made it out of Russia and into the rail yard of North Korea. 
I looked to my right and saw rusted train car pieces and trivial small fires littering the rail yard. I looked to my right and all of a sudden, there was Hong Kong Border Patrol. They were standing there, in a line, expressionless, with their black bulletproof vests over their white short-sleeved shirts. I knew I better get to North Korea quick, so I started walking through the derailment rubble. Someone in Hong Kong blew a whistle and yelled something like, Start! And all of a sudden, the line of guards was walking toward me. I started to jog. I was getting away, putting space in between them and myself. The whistle blew again with another yelled command that I somehow understood. They were jogging now, and the gap between us stopped growing. I started to run. The whistle blew immediately, and I was no longer gaining ground. I couldn't run any faster, and they were mere feet behind me. The whistle blew again, and their expressionless faces became intense as they changed their gait to something unbelievable. Their stride increased, and the rate of their feet touching down increased. They were bounding, and they were catching up to me. I was at my max speed, and all I could do was struggle more. How is this possible, I thought. I run... <laughs> I run Bloomsday. I have longer legs than them. One of them grabbed me from behind and lifted me off my feet. I was being swept along at an incredible rate. Along the tracks we went, as if the pack of guards had become some sort of unwieldy locomotive that couldn't stop quickly. I faced forward as we passed railcar debris. Over my vision, a sort of HUD popped up with a message in red and white English text. There were a set of instructions. Step one was that I was being subdued by Hong Kong Border Patrol. Step two, I would feel a series of pressure points. Three, the pain would cause me to pass out. There were indeed pressure points. The guy who grabbed me had his fingers pressing into me, on my neck, shoulders, side, and groin. This was highly inappropriate, I thought, but the instructions say it's okay. Hmm, step four. Gah, I don't even care. He should be nice and at least trim his fingernails every now and then. On either side of the rail yard was a sort of a hallway with Tron-like, neon green colored walls with soft, out-of-focus edges. Every now and then there would be openings on either side of the hallway. Refugees, unable to make it into any country, looking in as the Hong Kong Border Patrol flew past. We were decelerating. I knew that if we made it far enough, I would be on North Korean ground, and I'd be safe from the Hong Kong guards. I kept hoping. I felt that if I could make contact with anybody, Hong Kong would set me free. As we decelerated, I saw Teresa Harper, the ugly girl from high school, sitting on a chair, looking sad and bored. I stretched my hand out to her. She saw me and grabbed my hand, knowing the look of someone in need. I'm sorry, Teresa, you were made fun of in high school. Your years of torment have undoubtedly made you realize the value of helping others. Hong Kong Border Patrol let me free, and I went on to North Korea with Teresa. We considered marrying. I woke up.